Hey everybody, how's it going? My name is Adam Neely. I'm here answering all of your questions about bass and music in general. So, let's get started. Well, before we begin, I recently was on the Music is Win podcast. I talked to Tyler for like a half an hour on bass, guitar, and Berkeley, and all sorts of things, so check that out if you're interested. And yeah, let's get started for real this time. Jake Mole writes, How do you analyze the chord progression from the chorus of Stevie Wonder's Sir Duke? The chords are B, F minor, E, C sharp minor 7, F sharp 7. What role does the F minor play? Is there a music theory justification for using this chord? Great content as always. Warning, this answer contains a lot of theory and is quite long. If your eyes roll at that thought, please skip ahead to about 8 minutes and 20 seconds in this video. Thanks. So I love this song. There's so many different ways that you can look at the chord progression in the chorus. One, as the composer and performer, and two, as the music theoretician trying to pull apart how the chord progression works. Let's first take a look at it at how Stevie Wonder probably thought about it. So we have this melody in the key of B major. Let's listen to it. So that F minor chord is a little strange because it doesn't seem to have any sort of functional relationship back to B, but there might be a reason why we included it in the chord progression. Let's check out the rest of the song. So when Stevie Wonder is writing this, he needs to figure out a chord that goes with that A sharp in the first melodic fragment. he could start trying to figure out chords that go with it from the key of B, like maybe an F-sharp. That doesn't really sound right at all. Even though technically the harmonization is okay, it doesn't sound wrong, it's just not right. So what other chords could you have? Well, maybe you could have the three chord. That has the A-sharp in it, a D-sharp minor chord. Okay, that sounds all right, but it doesn't have the drama of an F minor seven. That A sharp right there, and harmonic to B flat, is a natural 11 on the F minor seven chord. And so that chord has more color, not just because it's outside of the key, but because there's a color tone right there. If Stevie Wonder chose a D sharp minor chord, there's not quite as much color at a moment of drama. You see, composers are not really thinking functionally as they compose most of the time. They're thinking color, they're thinking aesthetics, they're thinking about things which create drama. But now we're here, it's after it was composed, so what is the theory behind this F minor seven? There's actually three versions of this, and I think each one is pretty interesting. The first way of looking at this is that this F minor 7 is the related 2 chord to the 3 in the key of B, which in this case would be D sharp minor. So this chord right here is related to a key that's being tonicized. You see, in functional harmony, what happens very often is that you get these kinds of keys within keys. So D sharp minor is being temporarily tonicized by way of this F minor 7, a 2 chord. Now typically a 2 chord is part of a 2-5 progression, so if we were using this in the context that it means, it would sound like this. So this sort of chord progression might be familiar to you if you're familiar with Mendelssohn's Wedding March, because the very first chord of the Wedding March is the sharp 4 minor 7 flat 5 that tonicizes the 3 minor. Check it out. The problem here is that in the Mendelssohn, this is an F minor 7 flat 5, not an F minor 7 like it is in the Stevie Wonder. And so this flat 5 is a B. It keeps it more to the key of B, so it's easier to hear this chord in relationship to the key of B than it is this chord. What complicates this further is that the F minor 7 in the Stevie Wonder doesn't actually resolve to the 3 chord, it resolves to the 4 chord. So it's a little unlikely to say that that F minor 7 is a 2 minor 7 to a 3 chord which never gets resolved. Instead what you could say is that this F minor 7 is not functional, but it does relate to the chord that it resolves to by way of voice leading. Check this out. If we play an F minor 7, it's just a matter of shifting the root and the fifth down a half step to the root and the fifth of the chord that it's resolving to. The third and the seventh of the F minor seven, A flat and E flat, and harmonic G sharp and D sharp stay the same. So, 
the resolution comes from the fact that everything is moving by half step. The key to this, to keeping us in the key, is the fact that it's being moored down by the G sharp and the D sharp, which are both within the key of B. So this doesn't sound super weird and super out of the key, it just sounds like it's kind of a cool color in it, which is our perception of it. And that's why most people, myself included, would probably be okay with this analysis because it reflects how we're hearing it. But there's a third analysis that I find fascinating. And that analysis says that there's a kind of a hidden shadow chord progression underneath the chorus of Sir Duke. And that chord progression is basically one, six, two, five, one. And so this F minor 7 is actually functionally related to a 1, 6, 2, 5, 1 progression. This F minor 7 has a function, it's just that it's hard to see. Let me show you what I mean. So we're going to play the melody how it normally is. And instead of this A sharp being harmonized with an F minor 7, we're going to harmonize it with a G sharp 7, 13, 9. The thing that's fascinating about this chord is that if you just rearrange the notes and put the F on the bottom, it ends up sounding like an F minor 7. The thing is, is that this G sharp 7 chord, including the F sharp if you take into account the notes from the melody, has a functional relationship to the key of B. It's the 5 7 of 2. So what this basically tells you, or at least in this analysis, is that this isn't an F minor 7, even though it sounds like it and it looks like it. It's in fact a G sharp 7 with a very functional relationship to a 2 minor 7. Now this is complicated a little bit because the F minor 7 in the original progression does not resolve to a 2 minor 7, instead it resolves to an E major 7. So the shadow chord progression is simply the underlying skeleton from which these other chords are kind of extrapolated. It's the functional relationship of all these chords that is not so easy to see on the surface. In the shadow progression, the G sharp 7, the 5 7 of 2, would tonicize the 2, and then from there we would go to our normal 5 chord, although in this case we'd probably voice it as some form of 5 sus with a 9. I am typically would voice it with an E major over F sharp. I probably wouldn't play the natural 3rd because that natural third kind of clashes with the pentatonic melody, which is... So let me play for you back to back the actual chord progression in melody, and then the shadow chord progression. The thing that I find compelling about this analysis is that the name of the tune is Sir Duke. It's about Duke Ellington, and this G sharp 7 with the natural 13 and the natural 9 is a very Ellingtonian sort of color. Now whether or not Stevie Wonder was hearing this chord as a functional substitute to this chord is kind of a stretch. So I'm not saying that this is actually what's happening, but it is an interesting way of looking at it. Because the harmonic color of Duke Ellington is very much part of his style, and Stevie Wonder was using a slightly different style, but maybe, just maybe, the chords in the style that Stevie Wonder used have the same functional relationship as the ones that maybe Duke Ellington would use. I think it's an interesting thought. Abby Elizabeth writes, A question for your next Q&A. Have you ever had the opportunity to play in a Broadway pit, slash have you ever subbed in one before? If so, what was it like? Thanks. So I've never had the opportunity to play on Broadway before, but I have had the opportunity to play on off-Broadway cast albums, because sometimes off-Broadway shows just don't have the budget to hire a full band, so they'll just hire a pianist and a drummer, but for the cast recording, the official recording, they'll spring for a full band, and if you want to listen to me play on an off-Broadway cast album, you can listen to Triassic Park the Musical, or you can also listen to Rated P for Parenthood. The bass player on those recordings is uh, yours truly, so... Go nuts. The way that I got those gigs is I'd been kind of in the periphery of the New York City theater scene for a while. There's this thing called cabarets, which are very popular. Basically what happens is you have actors and singers put on these solo shows when they're not actually in full shows. So places like Feinstein's 54 Below, Lori Beachman Theater, Don't Tell Mama, those sorts of places. And you know, for a session bass player, the theater scene is kind of awesome because there's plentiful work, you, the work pays pretty decent if you get the right sorts of gigs, and it's a very professional environment if you play your cards right. These are kind of coveted gigs, and so when I finally got called to play a full run of a full off-Broadway show, I was really, really excited. And then I got fired from that show. 
Basically, the music director that hired me didn't really tell me that the show required a classical double bass player and not an electric bass player. And so when I got the sheet music, basically a couple days out from the first rehearsal, I panicked because I realized, I, like, this is just not who I am. I can't do this gig, but I can't say no. I can't back out because this is kind of a big opportunity for me. I also can't back out because I just backed out of two weeks of subbing on the national tour of Mamma Mia, which was another opportunity, but I chose the off-Broadway show. So I showed up to the first rehearsal having practiced my ass off and realizing it just was not good enough. I really, really flubbed everything. It sounded terrible, and I was kind of hoping that I could just skate by, but after the rehearsal, I got a call from the contractor saying, listen, we need you to quit. And I was a member of the union at the time, which means that it's very difficult to fire somebody from some of these shows, but I needed to quit if I wanted to stay in the good graces of the musical director and the scene, so I quit and it was devastating for me because I had given up something that was really awesome, this national tour of Mamma Mia, to do something even more awesome, and now I had nothing. And I felt like my whole career was kind of like done because I had put all my eggs in this basket of thinking, all right, well, my session career is gonna be around theater and I'll do like musical things off to the side. But this experience really taught me that if you're open to it, if one door closes, another door will open for you. So I took the amount of time that I had off now, now that I wasn't doing a full off-Broadway show, and I learned how to use Ableton Live, which was something that I was really curious about but didn't really have the time and energy and focus to really put into it. And now because of that, I have a very different outlook on music, very different outlook on my career, because I was so obsessed with the idea of making it as a session theater bassist for so long, and now that's kind of off to the side. So anyway, that's the story of me being fired for being really shitty at classical double bass. Auxiliary character writes, question for next Q&A. How are you? Well, thank you so much for asking. Uh, I'm okay. I'm fairly tired, a little stressed, but uh, caffeine makes everything better, so... Got my cup of joe here, and I got my G Sharp 7139 here, and uh, everything's gravy, so yeah. Siothis writes, I wonder if you've heard James Blake's song, Limit to Your Love. It's not really using frequencies that we can't hear or anything, but it uses an annoying low frequency sound really beautifully to create a sense of release when it stops playing and works beautifully in the song, in my humble opinion. Interesting stuff. I'd like to hear more songs that incorporate this. Oh man, this tune is so great. Thank you for bringing it up. It's actually a cover. Feist did it originally, and her version is quite different, but also really good. And I really like this tune because it is actually something that really inspired me after I got fired from that off-Broadway show when I was first getting into electronic music. The reason why it inspired me is because there are so many production elements that I'd never heard before, and it kind of opened my eyes to what was possible. That like low tremolo sub bass is insane. It's so awesome when you hear it, especially through a car stereo system. It almost kind of reminds me of the sensation of listening to a 32-foot organ stop. That's sort of like so low that it's not pitch, but you're hearing this kind of helicopter whirl. It's fantastic. I love it. There's another moment later on in the piece of music that's really fascinating because the sub bass, which doesn't have the tremolo, actually plays a G natural against an E flat minor in the right hand. Check it out. That sounds really weird when I play it on piano. And the reason why it sounds weird is because that G down there clashes with the G flat and the E flat minor chord. And that G clashes because the harmonics present in the sound, the timbre of the piano itself, the piano sound, really do not add up to anything that matches the harmonics of this G flat. Listen to it. These are the harmonics of the G. Woo! That's spicy. So the reason why it works, or at least does not kind of come across as aggressively dissonant in the James Blake tune, is because the sound of the sub bass itself does not have all of these harmonics in it. The sound is a very harmonically neutral tone. It's kind of a sine wave. And so there's what music theorists would call stratification between the piano part and the sub bass part. Those weird clashes of notes do not affect us the same way if they were part of the same instrument, in this case, piano. So 
I find the whole James Blake limit to your love thing really fascinating because it shows the stratification at play and it creates all these weird dissonances that don't affect us the same way that that does. A horse in a hospital rates for Q&A. When it comes to music theory, something close to 100% of educational videos on YouTube are dedicated to tonal or rhythmical aspects of it. I'm very much into music which lacks both drone slash noise and seek to expand my um, artistic palette by gaining knowledge. Is there anything you would recommend to read which explores the timbral side of things? So if you want to really get that knowledge of timbre, I think that you want to study musical acoustics and not music theory because acoustics deals with that sort of thing in a lot more of a direct way. There isn't much out there in music theory land that deals exclusively with timbre because that's generally thought to be kind of a subset of acoustics if you're trying to study it scientifically and very specifically. But if you want to go down a rabbit hole and there's not much stuff out there, check out spectral music. Spectral music refers to the processes of certain French composers, and also I think Romanian composers, like Tristan Murel, where they take a look at the spectrograph of a certain instrument, like say a tuba, and take a look at the timbre of the tuba and see what harmonics occur when, and compose music based upon the harmonics of individual instruments, rather than thinking in terms of scales and chords and keys or anything like that. It's a really fascinating subject, and there's not a lot of stuff out there, but if you want to go down that rabbit hole, check out spectral music. Kevin McCulloch writes, Hey Adam, I was curious about your relationship with the sound man on gigs. Which characteristics make a memorable and professional engineer, and what traits get on your nerves a lot? Also, what do you think about the engineer being an extension of the band? As an aspiring live sound engineer, it'd be helpful to get some real-world perspective on the matter. Keep up the good shiz, thanks. So from my perspective, for somebody who is outside of the field, in other words, somebody who is a performer and also audience member, there are two things that I look for in a sound engineer. One, the ability to mix to the room, which usually means not mixing too loud and also aiming for clarity and separation between all of the instruments. Two, a positive attitude and also presence, the ability to react to changes. So if the sound goes bad for whatever reason, you are there, you're trying to fix it. Really, there's just those two things, and anything else really is kind of secondary. A good sound engineer is my best friend. A good sound engineer is somebody that I pine for. I love good sound engineers because they make my time on stage meaningful. They make it so that all the job, all the work that I had done to get on stage now has a payoff. The audience can now connect to my vision, whatever it is, or also connect to the sound or just connect with what's happening on stage so much easier if you have a good sound engineer. And if you have a bad sound engineer, None of that happens. That's my thought. Sound engineers are make it or break it for me, and I am very passionate about having good ones versus bad ones. Jackson Becker writes, Hey Adam, I've been accepted to Berkeley. Should I go? Yes, I do fully recommend going to Berkeley if you can afford it. Just realize that it is not the magical playland that all of the marketing materials would lead you to believe, but it's still a great environment for learning music. Falcon writes, Yo, question for your next Q&A. Watching this video got me wondering about notes. Is there really such thing as out-of-tune notes? Is tuning a specific note to a specific frequency all man-made? I think that the standardized system for tuning might limit music in a way. Think about it. Weird frequencies, if used effectively, could evoke many feelings or atmospheres in music. Basically, do you think standardized tuning might prevent out-of-tune music from being a thing? So I love that you're thinking along these lines because it's something that I've been thinking about for the past couple of years. I've been thinking about tuning and why we have the current system that we do because we didn't always have this current system. In fact, this current system is fairly new in the grand scheme of things, having 12 evenly spaced notes throughout the octave. This is something called 12 tone equal temperament. But it doesn't need to be that way. For the piano, of course, it's very difficult to break out because there are 12 evenly spaced notes, but when you have the human voice at play, which is something that we've had for thousands of years, actually, we've had it since the dawn of man, you can use it to reach subtler shades of expression. For example, have you ever noticed that in the beginning of the Lion King song, you know, that when the circle of life thing, the singer is singing really out of tune, but it doesn't sound that way. <laughs> what the singer is doing is they're using something called the harmonic seventh. So it doesn't sound like this. It sounds a little bit different than that because that harmonic seventh does not exist in our 12 tone system, but it exists in the harmonic series. That's just one of the many 
many kinds of out of tune notes that you have at your disposal if you're singing or if you're playing violin or if you're playing any other instrument besides piano. Humans have been thinking about tuning for thousands of years and there have been many, many different kinds of ways of tuning. Tuning and the idea of being out of tune is kind of a social construct. We're just super used to hearing these notes in this particular order because of the saturation all across the globe. If you want to start going down this rabbit hole, check out some of 12 Tones YouTube videos, which is kind of an ironic name for a YouTube channel that explores certain systems that might sometimes use more than 12 tones, but really great videos. It's really exciting to check out some of these, what we would call Zen harmonic concepts, concepts that explore ideas and sound beyond the 12 tones of the keyboard. So very excited for you. You're about to, uh, about to be exposed to a realm of music that is not often covered. Sam de Mercurio writes, Hey Adam, I've never heard Western microtonal music that was actually enjoyable. Do you know of other cool microtonal artists? <clears throat> yeah, sure. The artist that I think everybody should check out if you're into microtonal stuff, or at least want to start maybe dabbling in it without going too far off the deep end, is a producer by the name of Sevish. His stuff is awesome because it's really weird, wacky microtonal stuff, but He's also producing it from like an electronic music perspective. So you kind of still have the grooves and the sounds and the timbres of electronic music, but now you also have this added layer of weird microtonalness. Really cool stuff. Pet of War writes, if you pitch shift the frequency at 09, you can hear the lick. Ah, uh, Adam, you and your Easter eggs. So you're the first person to figure that out. I assume that everybody would figure that out. But yes, that video featured the lick in infrasound. So if you pitch shift everything at 09 up like two or three octaves, maybe four octaves, you'll hear the lick very clearly. So yes, infrasonic lick coming at you. Ed Gutierrez writes, Somebody once told me that alternating fingers was preferred when playing one note like at 546. Does it not matter too much? A fair number of people asked me about this. In the Apartment Sessions video, I'm playing bass with one finger. Now, here's the question. Why would we play with just one finger when we could play with two fingers and play Donna Lee at 5,000 miles per hour and impress everybody? So I've been making YouTube videos for a while now, and about six years ago, I made a video talking about one finger bass playing just by talking into a webcam. And at the time, I thought wearing that hat was a good idea. In the video, I explore some of the ideas behind one finger bass playing and explain that it all kind of comes down to what I would call the insistence of articulation. And what that basically means is that every single note has the same attack and every single note has the same sort of general feeling to it because it's attacked and it's played the same way. The articulation is insisted upon, I guess what that means. So for a lot of rock bass lines that have repeated eighth notes, I'll play them with my one finger because of this insistence of articulation. It's kind of similar to how guitarists might play similar lines with all downstrokes on their pick. Most of the time, I honestly don't find it really all that limiting. This isn't to say that you shouldn't practice with two fingers and getting a nice even tone from two fingers, but there are circumstances which end up sounding and feeling better if you just use one finger. With some practice, you can actually play some fairly complicated and syncopated bass lines using in just one finger. The bassist James Jameson was really famous for doing this. He called it his hook when he was just playing these complicated bass lines with just the index finger. So I'm not saying that you should use one finger versus two fingers. Just know that it is an option available to you. You're not dumbing down your technique by just using one finger. You're just using a tool available to you to lock in with everybody around you. Leon Harperger writes, Adam, both you and Beato are a huge disappointment lately. You are more advanced writers than I am, but I've chosen to pander to your growing fan base. Arcade Fire? Really? They aren't even good indie if such a thing exists anymore, let alone playing boring, old, cliche harmony, melody, and rhythm. Consider me unsubscribed from both of you. We as human beings love to create a sense of self, a sense of identity, around the works of others. What will happen very often is we'll find an artist or a musician or a creator, or in this case, an educator with whom we identify and say, aha, this is me, or at least this aspect of their work is me, what I aspire to do and who I aspire to be because I like their work. Now, if a band changes artistic direction for whatever reason, the reaction from their fan base very often is not one of, nah, I just don't like them anymore, I'm gonna find another band. No, the reaction is, how dare they? They're selling out. They don't reflect who I am anymore. And that's what's happening. If you dislike what I do, I don't owe you your sense of self, and neither does Rick Beato or any musician or any band or any creator. They do not owe you that sense of identity. I'm allowed to like things that you don't like, and you might not like 
everything that I like, and that's okay. And you know, honestly, <sighs> the best uh, words of wisdom I have is, <laughs> this is not an airport. You do not need to announce your departure. So I'm sorry you disliked my last video where I played Arcade Fire, but 